Welcome to Episode 7 of Space Buzz, the podcast. We're your hosts, Michael Green, Rich Hobby, and Philip Swan. We also have Megan back here again with us, and we're going to be talking about hemp and GMOs, also known as genetically modified organisms, and its implications on farming of all kinds, and ultimately, us humans. So how's everybody feeling today? Feeling good. Pretty chill. Fantastic. Okay, let's get right into it. Is anyone familiar with this quote? Hemp is of the first necessity to the health and protection of the country, unquote. Uh, Yeah, ding, ding. That's uh, good old Tommy Jefferson. They knew very well, as a lot of the founding fathers, as to the long list of benefits of growing hemp. It's important to keep in mind, though, that while hemp is uh, of the same plant species as marijuana, it's genetically different and differentiated by its use and kind of its chemical makeup. Yeah, and industrial hemp refers to marijuana plants that are grown for either agricultural or industrial use. And hemp plants are usually low in THC. I think in the federal farm bill, they have to be under 0.3% THC to be considered U.S. federal grade hemp. Okay. Yeah, and in fact, the founding fathers were very aware that hemp could very well be the key to a prosperous, self-sustaining, harmonious with nature economy in the country or even on the planet. Right. So with all that they knew then and all that we know now, why in the world would the marijuana plant and thus hemp still be illegal? I think to answer the question, you kind of have to first ask this question. I mean, who benefits from medicinal or recreational marijuana being branded as illegal, both nationally or globally? I think before we can begin to realize who's profiting from this, it's important to realize the whole scope of how hemp can really benefit our country. And there's a lot of things, like take combating climate change or deforestation, fighting hunger, clothing shortages, alternative energy, and those are kind of just a few examples off the top of my head. Yeah, I'd say those things are definitely worth exploring more, considering the state of things since hemp and marijuana were made illegal. And becoming dependent on less renewable and polluting options as a country, I think it's honestly really fascinating that we haven't become more involved with hemp. Yeah, not to mention the booming international trade we could create with something we can grow domestically in the U.S. and have actually been required by law to do so in the past. Yeah, I mean, the state of Kentucky was known as the hemp capital of the U.S. and it even hosts the nation's hemp museum. Right, and at a time when job growth in sustainable industries is going to be more important than ever, and most of our founding industries seem to be failing us, I think hemp, alongside marijuana and the industry that we're all involved in, could very well hold part of the answer we're kind of looking for. It's always been here, but I think people just need to become aware of its true nature and stop kind of associating it with just the stereotypical clothing lines and necklaces that are associated with the negative aspects of the hippie culture. Yeah, the image definitely was intentionally created, so as I mean, like more so to deter people from giving hemp industrial credibility. I think tagging on that typical stoner critique is uh, placing a really negative outlook on it, and it made it harder for people to see the real benefits. And propaganda definitely distracted the U.S. for sure. Yeah, I think when we take a really closer look, it'll fill a hole that we've been having for a while and create a completely new industry in this country that we could be the most successful on because we've had people growing hemp and cannabis for a long time. Not necessarily through legal means, but... Totally. Yeah, I'd say it's definitely time to get back to our roots. And those roots lie in hemp. Right, exactly. Okay, so what does it mean when we say that hemp can combat climate change or deforestation or even fight hunger, clothing and shelter shortages, or offer alternative energy options? Don't forget, there's also all the potential jobs and ripple effects that reinstating this seemingly founding principle of our country would have. Yeah, and the potential impact of legalized hemp and all the industries it can affect. This may really help you to understand why certain types of industries banded together to make sure that it was illegal and they're trading the common good for a buck to this day. Right, and until we kind of demand the change collectively and keep paying for unhealthy alternatives, like in our food supply, we can expect this to keep happening, and it's probably only going to get worse, which it already has. I definitely think once uh, everybody kind of realizes how important hemp was to the fabric of our economy in the past, it'll become clear as to why marijuana needed to be kind of quote-unquote framed the way it was through countless propaganda strategies in order to scare the public until it was made illegal. But it's really interesting to see the way that we've kind of, history has kind of changed itself now to where it is legal. Right, like like kind of the reefer madness and that whole era of anti-marijuana campaigns. It was pretty much a roundabout way of making hemp illegal because the lobbyists knew that the idea of proposing to outlaw hemp outright at the time would have seemed as absurd of outlawing error. So what could some of the modern day ripples of hemp legalization be? How about we start with deforestation and climate change? One of the main reasons for cutting down trees is for paper. Yeah, one of the common myths about hemp paper is that the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights were originally written on it. 
This is more likely a testament to the fact that until 1883, 75 to 90% of the world's paper was made with hemp fiber. It doesn't change the fact that hemp was grown and used for paper in a variety of ways at the time. Another major need for deforestation was for procuring timber and uh, building materials has led to deaths and extinctions of unknown numbers of possibly undiscovered species throughout the world. Which is pretty sad. And deforestation can also occur because of the demand for fuel production, which is usually in the form of charcoal, but to be fair, it's not as commonly used as biofuels. Yeah, and I mean, biofuels can be produced from hemp and they can replace the need for harvesting fuel from our forests and leave them to do the real job, which is acting as the planet's air filter. And it would allow us for some kind of energy independence. Because if we're growing the hemp here, then we don't have to rely on right, international... Right, energy independence and something, a great export. Totally. It kind of is mind-blowing to, to think in the um, grand scheme of things that it takes uh, 30 years plus to replace a forest, which just honestly leaves too much of an opening for someone to develop and move on and kind of change their mind and not recreate that forest area. But you can re reproduce your own hemp cover crop and over and over again within months in a controlled area and different variables and kind of grow it to how you would like. Yeah, and deforestation is been a major contributor to global warming and is commonly noted as one of the leading causes of the enhanced greenhouse effect. By eliminating the deforestation of the planet, we'll be combating climate change on one of the largest levels. And the answer kind of hemp is right there, staring at us in the face. So what's wrong with this picture? I mean, to go even further, plastics, which we all know are some of the leading environmental hazards that we still use in everything, could be replaced by hemp products as well. Yeah, hemp fiber can be mixed with other types of fibers to create bioplastics, products that greatly reduce their carbon footprint on the world. Imagine adding up every plastic item in the world and reducing its harmful impact on the planet. Could it be that strong? I mean, we're talking about that with the, remember, like a credits card's worth of plastic? Oh, God. Every People week. Eat. Oh, my God. Yeah. Well, see, even my trash. Like, every every time I look at the trash, it's like 80% of the things in my trash can have some sort of plastic item infused in them. And it's literally impossible to avoid, even in our industry. And I mean, recycling is getting more difficult unless people want to take the burden of it. It's yeah. wild. All the packaging that food comes in and just any product you buy, there's always so much packaging that comes along with it. Right, it's just like, and then there's packaging for the packaging, mm -hmm. and it just keeps compounding mm -hmm. it. But, I mean, aside from just the plastic, I mean, the first cars were made from hemp and ran on biofuel, and they were tested by Henry Ford himself for the strength of the materials. And totally just to tack on really quick, integrating hemp into our plastic consumption can also make a major impact in combating climate change for a multitude of reasons. I mean, if it's possible to integrate hemp with other microfibers to create bioplastic, I, mean, I just don't understand why we wouldn't. A lot of it doesn't make sense. Okay, let's move on to hemp's nutritional value. So, hemp can actually be prepared in a variety of easy ways ranging from salads by just using the leaves, hemp milk, which a lot of us actually now get in our coffee, or hemp oils and seeds, uh, just to name a few. If you look closely, you'll learn that hemp isn't like every other plant on the planet. It has unique properties and seems to be specifically designed to help the overall existence of human beings and their ability to just be harmoniously exist in balance. Personally, myself, I've really tried to cut out a lot of dairy products and meat lately, and I've really noticed a difference in just I'm not as laggy and I don't feel as groggy all the time. And and it's pretty trippy that hemp seeds just to themselves, they contain an, enough fatty acid, fatty and amino acids required by the human body just in the seeds. So that's pretty fascinating. Yeah, it's one of the only, I think, seeds or plants that contains a high enough amount of both omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. Right, and then kind of coming back to what you're saying, Megan, those nutrients have an effect on a variety of different body functions, including your metabolism, the emotions, the brain, the heart. Knowing just a little we know about hemp now and how it can be used as a nutritional replacement, it stands to reason that a hemp diet alone could be healthier than the average American's diet. Yeah, but what can we expect? There's not a ton of money providing healthy food that can be grown for the mass population, let alone the fact that there's no money for the major pharmaceuticals. They don't have to treat all the illnesses that stem from the unhealthy products that are being stealthily forced down our throats. Something that I've heard a lot of times in my life, which is just getting started, but is there's more nutritional value in most of the wrappers over the products found in the average gas station item at 7-Eleven or what have you. And that's honestly really scary to think about and makes me envision the future and what that's going to bring. I really hope that there's some sort of change that we can make because I don't want my kids to have to live through things like that or experience unhealthy things like that. Well, it's the whole idea of like subsidies. Look at the crops that are most subsidized. It's like corn and soybeans, which are essentially grains that we feed to animals for the most <laughs> part. Um, it puts things in a different So it's like profit over people. That's right. what we face. 
and again, it's like until we demand the change, we kind of expect the worst. So have to really educate ourselves uh, and utilize that as the first line of defense. So become educated and aware, then find a way to, to I guess, make or inspire change. So if hemp were to become a gross national product again, the ripple effect at home and around the world would be exponentially positive, you could think. Yeah, hemp is known to be very resilient and easy to grow, even in some of the toughest climates in the world, so it makes it more accessible to grow all over. Another cool, interesting factoid would be, you know, it might be reaching a little bit, but hemp feeds people in a lot of different ways, and, you know, technically you can use ropes made from hemp fiber. They've historically been used to make nets for tell people fish and also feed themselves, so there's definitely lots of ways that we can apply hemp. Well, I mean, it's reaching a little bit, but it's definitely still applicable and makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I think that the Vulcan logic is sound there. Agreed. Okay, so let's move on to hemp and shelter. So hemp can also be used to create shelter that can be waterproof, fireproof. I mean, imagine how many city fires and fatalities throughout history could have been prevented from materials that just burned a little less. I mean, seriously, and it's self-insulating, so you can save on winter heating costs and is naturally resistant to vermin and other pests. And I think the building material, which is called hempcrete, is also very lightweight, making building and transporting it a lot easier. That's definitely something that's a new learning curve for me. I didn't even realize that hemp was necessarily um, fireproof and things like that. But I mean, it's not just used for obvious, but in many aspects of the building construction process, starting at the foundation, through the walls, the panels, rooftop shingles, I mean, even plumbing in the paint, which is also mind-blowing that you can create paint from hemp. I know. I know <laughs> like, that's that's that. awesome. <laughs> it's like it's too good to be true. Well, it's not. It's just kind of been kept hitting. And speaking of hidden technologies, this could be a good time to move on to the alternative energy applications of hemp. Careful now. <laughs> right. You don't want big oil coming after you, buddy. <laughs> no. But, you know, hemp can actually be used to create biofuels to replace gasoline and diesel engines. And this is just scratching the surface of its applications. But it's a very strong starting point with major industrial implications. Yeah, the fact that the source of energy is also renewable, comparing it to fossil fuels, think how we can change supply and demand. It can mean a whole new understanding of for having enough energy and fuel to go around while not damaging our planet and air quality. And then also, like we were saying, the implications of energy independence. Right, I understand why people want to stick with, you know, uh, why certain people would want to stick with the energy we've been using. But like in all things, we kind of create and discover new technologies and new ways to do things, like new engines that run off of new fuels. And sometimes the negative aspects of those things aren't realized until later. But when you do realize that, what we do with that knowledge makes all the difference. And we should demand accountability when we realize the things that we thought were safe for us are known now to be unsafe. We should hold them to a different standard and accountability and implementation going forward. Yeah, more and more studies are publishing showing how the use of visual oil, while once thought to do more good than bad, has been proven to be a cancer on the planet. A lot like cigarettes and then the discoveries in the late or the last century about how something that was considered at one point a, a healthy additive to uh, a, a virulous living has now uh, been you know, deemed as like one of the causes of one of the largest amount of heart disease and, and lung disease in, in, in the world. Right, and all the medical costs associated with that. I mean, that's a really good analogy. And yeah, quitting smoking can be really difficult, but the rewards are worth it. And finding safe alternatives to oil is the answer to long-term health benefits for the human population on this earth. And it's not preaching, it's just simply math. When you look at the damage that's been caused and just the limited resources, it's just kind of, we need to find alternative solutions. Nah, man, definitely preach it, brother. Preach it. <laughs> okay, so does anyone have any other great hemp benefits we want to include before we run out of time, move on to the samples and talking about GMOs? Well, Mike, did you know that hemp was used in Navy ropes and helped win the war? But no, really, are, are we actually <laughs> going to be uh, sampling any GMOs today? So we wanted to give some other farms a spotlight, and the current GMO that we have is from Tao, and we sampled their Purple Punch. It was, the, I think, the first, Big second. Guy. It was the Maybe second okay. episode was Purple Punch. And their GMO is fantastic. Where's your strain journal, Philip? <laughs> <laughs> I just want to add also real quick that hemp is also medicinal outside of marijuana. Personally, I use it a lot for, you know, topicals and lotions and stuff for back pains. You know, lots of crampy muscles and aches and stuff working on the farm and just being up and going all day. It's definitely nice to have that towards the end of the day when you can just rub it on and feel a lot of relief. It's becoming a lot of uh, really common for animals to find therapeutic effects from hemp in their diet as well. And it's just definitely becoming all over beneficial. 
Yeah, I didn't realize that either. It always seems like they're that's solely reserved for marijuana and hemp is always just industrial. So it's interesting that there's more applications. And these are just a few dozens, if not more, of hemp applications that could have dramatic impacts on how we occupy our planet and increase the lifespan of our species by an untold amount of years. I mean, just take a minute and appreciate how just these different types of applications alone have a major impact on the world as we know it. Is it kind of any surprise that the newspaper, cotton, and petroleum industries were the major powers behind hemp being made illegal? And since then, the biggest like anti or biggest lobbyists against cannabis have been big pharma, alcohol, private prisons. I think certain pro sheriff or cops groups who are being tapped out to come and start promoting. And since that time, there's been a lot of anti hemp dash marijuana support from big pharma, alcohol, private prisons, and a lot of other lobbyist groups who have been pushed out to promote an anti cannabis agenda. Yeah, this joint action in turn has made them titans of capitalism and the largest burdens on our planet and its resources. Right, so basically it's the ideal portrait of success based on our country's current legislative standards of corporate accountability and responsibility of their products towards the consumer and the planet's well-being in today's world. I mean, just take a second to think of all the products you know and they could be replaced by hemp, many of which are imported from somewhere else. That means that someone else also creates them, so that fills the need that we you know, we need. Yeah, I mean, seriously, imagine if we could replace all of those products, like all of them, with homegrown ones that demand the creation of jobs also supplied here in America. I mean, for the countries who can do the same, they should empower themselves also. And for those who can't or won't, then at least we'll be able to begin to have the flow of revenue reverse directions a little bit and put money back into the pockets of Americans who can make the products that they can stand behind. And that also become a positive impact on their communities. And if we're exporting it around the world, also those communities as well. I mean, I was reading an article where they said that 25,000 products have hemp in it. So why shouldn't we be the number one exporter of hemp? Right. It just seems to make sense. Definitely. It's kind of trippy, though. A lot of people still associate hemp and marijuana industries and anything else as off-putting as the failed drug war of 40 years. You know, it's just kind of a bummer that even I have family members who still look down on it so negatively, but it's been such a positive thing in my life. It's, it's wild that they still have such a negative outlook on it, you know, don't want to open up their minds and stuff. But it won wars. <laughs> right. and I mean, if you're going to be thinking of the hemp business as negative and shady, it's pretty much just being misinformed as to its origins and the science that kind of presents its real applications. I mean, as Americans in general, aren't we kind of tired of being known as being the largest consuming and polluting nation by far on the face of the planet? I mean, this gives us an opportunity where we can lead by example and clean up our image and the planet at the same time. And we also have a vanishing middle class that we can literally grow back using hemp in the cannabis industry. But legislation has to happen first. Well, now that we're aware, let's band together and take action to bring this industry back. Let's begin thinking for ourselves again and take the autopilot off before we head into the mountainside, because it is close approaching. I mean, there's definitely a lot of stuff that you can research out there, too, if you're, you know, if you have personal interest and have a lot of passion for it. And, you know, just get yourself prepared to be a part of it as this industry or as this industry returns home. Yeah, and the people who get in on the ground floor stand to have the largest positive influence and usually end up getting the most also. All right, well, I think it's time to move on to our volcano sacrifice. Uh, we won't be using any hemp products for this, but Philip, what are we sacrificing today? I'm busting out the strain journal as we speak. Yeah, so we're going to be sampling orange push pop from Rolling Stone. And orange push pop comes from Seed Junkie Genetics, who created ice cream cake and wedding cake, which we sampled ice cream cake in the first episode. Uh, but Rolling Stone is awesome. They grow really, really terpy strains as opposed to, I think, those high number, you know, testing strains. So everything that comes from just has really awesome flavor, including this orange push pop which is an orange cookies triangle kush cross. Mm. Smells so good. That sounds awesome. Yeah. And feel free to follow along by checking out our weighing in section on spacebuzzdispensary.com. Just click on the conspiracies icon and tell us what you think. And when we come back, we'll be discussing GMOs or genetically modified organisms, how it applies to farming and to what it could mean for the future of hemp and cannabis farming, as well as our food supply and our bodies. Oh yeah, let's do this. All right, be right back. Welcome back, everyone. Before we talk about genetically modified grown things, uh, let's talk about that organic dankness we just sampled. Uh, I can say that I feel positively stupendous. Uh, how are you all feeling? Pretty rad. 
pretty solid. It's uh, definitely some good flavors there. Yeah, I think, like you were saying about Rolling Stones, I mean, all their stuff has such a great turt profile, so it just tastes really good, and the orange really comes out on that. Reminds me of a really good, like, Asian orange that we tried from, like, Uku. I was just about to say that. And it's, like, happy and chatty, and even though it's a little late, it's still kind of, you know, you kind of have that go. It's like one of the, I feel like a lot of orange trains don't actually smell orangey, but this yeah. has, like, a real orange, like, like really punch to orange. it. Like, orange, yeah. It smells, I think it won a cup, right? Okay. Like the yeah. Ladies Choice Cup or something. I mean, it's like interesting because it's Sea Junkie, who makes, like, ice cream cake and wedding cake, and this is really different than both of those. I, I don't know if I get a tremendous body out of it, but I'd say this would be awesome like any time of day. Mm-hmm. It reminds me of tangy with more body. I'd say it has yeah, more body than tangy. Because some sure. tangies can just be super heady. Yeah, it's like and it's almost like a sour diesel yeah. type. Yeah, but not as racy. All right, well, th- thank you, Rolling Stone <laughs> Orange Pop. Orange Push Pop. Orange Orange number pop. five, I think. Well, yeah, well, thank you to Orange Push Pop number <laughs> five through nine. <laughs> 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 well, they change batches. I think this one's number five. This one's number well, what, why are they, Megan, when the, the farms give batches different numbers, why do they do that? It's usually just a different cut of that same, you know, that same genetics, but it's going to be a different pheno. Yeah, so it could express, like, sometimes they'll do number cuts, or sometimes they'll call the cuts by a certain person's name. Yeah, or it's kind of fun. There was, like, a... That stuff usually doesn't make it to the shelf labels and stuff like that, though. I but mean, I've seen, like, a... glazed donut cut before on certain strains. Yeah. Or, for instance, with Mac, Caps Cut's the most popular version of Mac. It's, like, Tao's Mac. Okay. Mm-hmm. There's lots of different cuts of uh, from Mac. I mean, different farms I worked at had Mac 17. You know, there was even a Mac 11. I know we've had Mac 1 and 2 for mm-hmm. sure from Dow. They were both really good. And these things can repeat, right? So it's not like a vintage. Like, it's not like a one and done and you'll never see. No, because you can five. continue. Well, it can be, but usually they'll want to keep growing it. I mean, mm-hmm. the thing with commercial cannabis that's interesting is a lot of times they might have a strain that's really good, but it's not commercially viable because the yields just aren't very good. Or alien cookies is a grow. good example of this. People who grow alien cookies are pushing it because they love the strain, but as far as yield goes, it didn't yield as well as, like, Mac does. Even Capillator said, like, I think uh, Alien Cookies is a better strain, but with Mac, with the miracle in it, it's much more stable, and it grows, like, the yields are much higher. Mm. I mean, there's also a lot of strains that take a lot longer to grow, too. GMO is actually one of those strains that takes about 12 to 13 weeks, so that's another reason why sometimes you don't see strains grow as often. Well, it kind of reminds me where you, like uh, with like Skywalker. It's a great strain, but it's finicky. Doesn't yield a lot, so you don't see it as often. And early on, you saw a lot of like Bubba Kush and a lot of Blue Dream, which are great yielders or easier to grow. Have to be very well received. One on more of the sativa, more known for sativa side, and Bubba more on the indica side. And they have to actually deliver, so that's good. But sometimes if you go for the heavier yielders, you just end up trying to push something that's not so good. So I think you know, if you can actually grow some of the better strains that put the time and effort into something that's more unique, it gives more demand for it, and you can usually get a higher price for it because there's less of it out there. So mm-hmm. you do get rewarded for doing it. I mean, I remember we've said that before. Like It's about the terpene profiles or the strains themselves over the THC percentages that you can get out of it. Right, or how crazy the name kind of gets. Like combining five things versus just one or two really good ones. All right. Well, after that little uh, <laughs> digression there, so uh, thank you, uh, travelers, for going on a little journey there. Now it's time for us to get into a little more talk about GMOs. So GMOs have been around for thousands of years through the process of selective breeding in agriculture. GMO, or known as GMO by a bunch of Um, has become the common term consumers and popular media use to describe foods that have been created through genetic engineering. Genetic engineering is a process that involves, ding, identifying the genetic information or gene that gives an organism, plant, animal, or microorganism a desired trait, ding, copying that information from the organism that has the trait, another ding, inserting that information into the DNA of another organism, and final ding, then grow in that new organism. So what does that mean for us? Why should we care? Today we're going to take a look into some GMO conspiracies and why they are still thought to be a practice in the shadow of modern conspiracies. So I never really heard too many positive things about GMOs. Is there such a thing that exists? 
Yeah, so golden rice is the poster child of the GMO movement, which is basically they took rice and modified it in a way to express more vitamin A to make it more n nutritionally dense. And they would use that in areas that were basically deficient in vitamin A. I think it was a quite a few places in Africa where they used it. There's other things too where they've been able to, for instance, bananas is a good example. Okay. Like the old banana was like the gross Michelle banana. That's like if you've ever had banana candy, it doesn't taste anything like the modern day banana. It's like if you've had banana runs, that's a good example. Um, They're so good though. <laughs> they are really good and they were sweeter back then. But it got wiped out by Panama disease, so they replaced it with the modern-day Cavendish banana. But then we're just going to have potentially the same issue happen because all Cavendish bananas are genetically identical. Well, yeah, because they're all a clone of one banana. That's what most people don't understand is that there's no seeds in that banana, which is why it was grown. Because people didn't want seeds. This is like... We were just having a conversation pre to recording about the laziness of humans. <laughs> and this is once again one of those problems that now bananas could be completely destroyed by another blight because they are, don't have any resistance. What's the idea of just sticking band-aids on problems? Well, when we get to that issue, well, you know, we'll get there, we'll it's get like there. It's a combination of like follow the money or follow the laziness. <laughs> Okay, so now we understand how uh, it inspired more research and development. Let's go into what happens next. What do we find about the negative effects of GMOs? So it kind of gets into like a tricky gray area specifically on GMO foods. A lot of the studies aren't done on humans. And I think that's they talk about that doing studies on humans could be unethical in the sense that it's like you're going to feed or you're going to eat an organic diet, but you're going to eat a GMO diet, which could potentially hurt you. So they won't do studies really on people. But they do do them on mice, which they use mice because we have like a scary, comparatively our DNA is very similar. Right, and they found in like small rodents, like mice, rats, that there are issues with like fertility and um, issues with the digestive tract, the liver. Uh, there was one study in France where the mice were just growing really large tumors. Oh, that's always great. <laughs> So why would GMO be pushed so hard over organic farming with all the documented health and environmental effects? It just doesn't, uh, just doesn't add up to me. Well, I guess that's kind of where the conspiracies come in. Kind of when it comes to GMOs, it pretty much spans the globe and you really can't avoid talking about Monsanto. Or uh, Bayer's Roundup cases, which is all part of Monsanto. So I guess you guys are saying we're not going to get sponsored by Monsanto? Yeah. <laughs> well, aside from that and, and the just huge pit of despair I've now fallen into knowing that that sponsorship money has disappeared, uh, what are some of the more common GMO conspiracies? Like, are they putting genetically modified food inside of us to ultimately genetically modify us? <laughs> uh, well, who knows? Maybe there's some truth in there. But we can look at some of the pretty well-known theories. I think one of them comes up from a study scaling like 190 million people in China that were believing uh, that Monsanto, with the help of the Pentagon, used GMOs to give cancer to the people. And the likelihood of why they're more likely to push or believe a position like this, I guess it could be that there's a lot of food safety issues there in the past. Internationally speaking, there's been some issues with United States imports in the past, so that could just kind of be a reason people are reaching for something like that. But they said that researchers reported that about 13.8% of the people who responded agreed with the circulated rumor in China that GMOs have been created by the U.S. as a form of like bioterrorism against China and that all patriots therefore oppose them. But a lot of other countries have right out of the gate banned GMO prior to anything being implemented right. anywhere, you know? So, I mean, that seems more like kind of trying to reach for dots, you right. know, when there's already like, it's like infrastructural problems, right? Everything's falling apart. It's like, oh, well, they're doing this to us. But things are falling apart already and there's sort of problems in the way it's all set up in the first place. Well, like Russia spoke to this in a way, like they said that, you know, if America wants their GMO foods, they can have them, but we don't want them. But that could also be more of a economic independence by securing their food supply that only they're growing their own products. They don't want the GMO foods because they might not be able to compete. So it's hard to know, like... Well, it's like how we were saying, why would you sort of... Something that's so unproven, has a lot of risk factors, and is so core to the survival of your people, our people, all people, be willing to just trade out so quickly your food supply for something kind of unproven which I guess you could either follow money or follow laziness, which is what you know, you're know getting back to, right? Yeah, definitely. And I saw a quote from that study that said, in quotes, 
genetically modified food is not merely a cause of cancer and a source of infertility. It's also a grand Western scheme, a monumental, supremely devious plot to annihilate the Chinese and other people of color created by Monsanto with the backing of the Pentagon and leading private foundations in the U.S. to control the global food chain. And that is some pretty heavy <laughs> <shit>. <laughs> I feel like that was just, like, but, read directly from the news desk. Well, it's kind of like how, you know, is that, to say specifically targeting certain people, I mean, look at the food and everything here. It's everybody. It's where everybody shops. Well, it's, that's what they're saying is the primary GMO foods are, like, the most popular foods we eat. So, like, but, corn and soybeans, it's like they put it in everything. It's also kind of frustrating to see a lot of healthier foods being a lot more expensive than things that are genetically modified. So it's becoming rare also because the, they're replacing the farms, so it's just supply and demand. Well, it comes to demand and subsidies, too. What gets subsidized? Corn. I mean, guys, I think we're avoiding, like, the biggest issue here is what of these GMOs is going to help me have kids that are mutants? I mean, <laughs> well, we're right really looking mutant, for the, the goal here. I mean, that's 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 that's, we're going the, for X -Men. that's the goal here, right? We're going for X Men. Is that we've no, X Men? As long as it's not the hills have eyes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there's two paths you go down there, right? You know, you some hills have eyes, but that's more radiation <laughs> and so much of uh, GMOs, but. I mean, really, I mean, that's the 80s baby to me. Like, I want to know which one of these is going to end up making us superhuman. Like, is, is that an option here with some Well, if that's GMOs? the case, it will become exclusive and expensive. So then it won't be so broadly accessible. <laughs> well, because if you look at popular culture, the thing is, like, GMOs, you know, they can be worked into horror storylines a lot. But really, if you look at some of the, the theories and what scares people the most in popular culture of this is, like, CRISPR and the ability to edit genes and to modify things in, in super crazy ways. That's so, where it kind of comes up where it's, like, it's a byproduct that was unintended when they're using gene suppression to create new things, that some of those those same editing passes along to the person that's eating or imbibing the food that's been genetically modified. So that because that the person mirrors certain genes that the food has, it can sort of mistake the user's genes for the genes it was initially programmed to suppress and do that to the user. So that's an interesting kind of correlation that is sort of supported and not supported, depending on what side of the study the light is being shined on from. Well, it's like the idea of them using uh, the genes, like making more actual insecticide with the plants. It's like we don't know over a long term how that's affecting us. And it's almost like a war of attrition in a way. Like there's no long term studies to know. Like just because the insecticide doesn't kill us instantly doesn't mean that over time well, even the we logic, just playing out logically, it's like just you know, like creating the super weeds and sort of the resilience that builds up and the problem that will continue to happen if you fight that with stronger ones and stronger, you know, more resilience comes back. So where is like the presentation that says this is going to be all better for everything in the end while we're simultaneously sort of eliminating our natural food supply? It's kind of uh, strange. It's like a similar argument with antibiotics. By giving people antibiotics all the time, you're naturally increasing the resistance of the bacteria. Totally. It makes it harder for you to be able to take antibiotics when you really need them. And it creates super bacteria. Right. So, so that it's like stronger, more powerful. Band-aids. Yeah. Or I'm just theory putting that it just weakens the immune system. So it's not as resilient to fight back later in life. Mm. So what about GMOs being used to reduce the population in Africa? I mean, GMOs have been tested in many African countries without long-term studies. So, I mean, is it really ethical to use people who are in impoverished positions as experiments? Yeah, there was a recent study from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem that published in the Human Reproduction Journal update that revealed the human sperm production dropped by 59.3% between 1973 and 2011, which is a pretty crazy decline if you think about it. Um, much of it's been blamed on chemical exposure, specifically chemical castrators like Atrazine? What the heck is I mean, how do they even get those metrics? Well, that's the thing, too. It's, it's kind, like, of, it's like kind of tricky to, to say, about, too, right? it's specifically that. I mean, there could be so many factors to that. Right. And, you know, even what you're asking about, I guess that, you know, what you're asking is, Megan, is sort of two parts. It's like, I think it's wrong to ever test anything on people, you know, just randomly in some random part of an impoverished world. Of course. Um, and as far as the uh, infertility, I guess that's sort of... I just am now thinking about that poor bastard who's been tracking sperm counts for years. <laughs> 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 he's just diminished my position. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> and he's just having to run around and be like, no, seriously, this is for science. And everyone's like, ah, you've been doing this for a while. You've been pretty out of session sorted it out this. by now. Um, and, you know, actually, I think the sperm count drops are also particularly prevalent in Western nations uh, like the U.S. where genetically modified foods are more widely consumed. I think Roundup was another one we kind of been mentioning today, but that one definitely uh, caused cancer in a lot of cases. I mean, there was some settlements and stuff, wasn't there? Yeah, I think that's like the biggest thing I've seen against the, in the anti-GMO argument. It's not necessarily the GMOs. It's the idea that Monsanto created Roundup. Roundup has all these issues. Then they go into settlements or they, like the WHO, for instance, said that glycophosphate is probably going to cause cancer or is likely to cause cancer. But like the FDA hasn't said much about it. And they're protected more by buyer beware now anyway. Right. So the accountability is not there. So it's like if you're, if we're going to trust Monsanto on their word on GMOs, it's like Roundup shows us that the track record's a little blurry. And from their own studies. Yeah, it's right. so a little biased. Um, and yeah, I mean, the, they just did a settlement. It was like 95,000 cases. It included $125 billion for potential future claims from Roundup customers who developed cancer like non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Yeah, so I guess what you're saying is that our health and fertility are already being attacked. So please, for the love of God, someone tell me that our cannabis is safe. Can new markets such as the cannabis market be cornered by big biotech companies? Could someone really become the new Monsanto of the cannabis world? Well, there's like a secret company called Biotech Institute LLC or something, and they began registering patents on the cannabis plant, which is interesting because I don't think you're supposed to be able to put patents on a plant. And I think three of them have already been granted, and they have several more coming down the pipeline, both in the U.S. and internationally. And they're not really even narrow patents on individual strains like, I don't know, sour diesel. These are utility patents, so they're the strongest intellectual property protection available for crops. Yeah, utility patents are so strict that pretty much anyone who comes in contact with the plant could be hit with a licensing fee, growers, shops, of course, but also anyone looking to breed new varieties or conduct research. Even after someone pays a royalty, they can't use the seeds produced by the plants they grow. They can only buy more patented seeds. That just seems freaking mind-blowing to me, honestly. Yeah. That just is very scary. I mean, definitely coming from a grower aspect, I would absolutely really dislike that. Well, a lot of people, too, in the <laughs> cannabis industry are really pro saying that utility patents don't really even make sense in this industry because being able to claim that you own a strain is kind of a ridiculous That's a notion. That's what stretch. we were saying about the ones, the twos, the threes before. I mean, each right. little variation. Is you know, you, you if say, you make a strain and I make the same strain number eight or something, Thing where the phenotypes are different, I don't see how you can claim that you made that unique strain. Right down to the molecular level. They could be, you know, they might not be the exact same, but they could be close enough and you just rename it something else. Well, are GMOs dangerous in cannabis? I mean, I was reading about the East Fork cultivars. Uh, stated goal was to grow more and better CBD-rich varieties of both hemp and marijuana. The difference is legal, not botanical. Cannabis sativa with 0.3% uh, or less THC is hemp. Anything more is weed under federal law. Uh, to do this, the farm partnered with Phylos Bioscience, a genomics firm that has for at least four years been crowdsourcing cannabis genetics to build a database of all the cannabis plants' various tones. Yeah, and the growing experiment was kind of underway for a while until there was a video of the Phylos, the CEO, I think it was Mowgli Holmes. It surfaced kind of speaking highly of partnering with the big ag to breed plants, and that led the East Coast cultivar to publicly break with Phylos. And they kind of sounded alarm bells for the cultivation side of the industry that there was sort of a big attack on the data because the guy went in, I think, you know, claiming, oh, I just want to kind of work with you guys, help it out. Right. We're not going to keep any of this information. I guess he said to those guys, like, uh, I'm the closest to these cannabis growers or something. Like, they trust me. That was, like, along the lines right, of what he was Right, it was sort of like what he was saying. Yeah, like, kind of implying, like, oh, I'm in, you know, and I can get this information, which is just... What's you know, the fastest way to get people to back out from you? Um, well, especially here. Yeah. In this state. That's one thing that's great about Oregon. There's a lot of pride in their craft. Hmm. All right, man. Well, hell, we've talked a lot about GMOs here. Is there anything else that we need to cover? Well, there's a lot of them, but... Yeah, there's an interesting thing called GERT, which is a uh, genetic use restriction technology in seeds, or they're called terminator seeds. Okay, I so, think that second name is a little better. <laughs> than Not for the purpose, but yeah, I mean, I had to pick. What well, doesn't sound it. intimidating about GERT? <laughs> Don't plant the GERT. Terminator <laughs> this seeds. This is a terminator, and this is 
Gert. <laughs> these, yeah, from Skynet. They just sent these to the Terminator suits. I still say serious Skynet. But. Mm-hmm. So basically, these plants, after they're done flowering, that's like the end of their cycle, and you got to buy more seeds wow. from the person. So, so is there they, any reason that that happens other than like self termination to have to replenish? Like, I think that's like what they found a gene that they could cause the plant to go through that cycle instead of actually after flowering, either producing seeds or having so it wasn't a like a byproduct of, of getting the end goal of the fruit or whatever it was that they wanted. They actually specifically added that on as like an add-on to what they were doing just to make it like self-destructive it sounds like it was more of a science experiment and then once people heard about it they're like we don't want this and then it was killed off pretty quickly because the farmer's image was horrible so it didn't really get implemented no because every farmer's like i'm not like they went to court i think for it or we're going to and then they kind of backed off it's funny that they would try and get kind of cornered into that uh, or sort of a roundabout way of sort of making you have to continually buy and depend on them, even though you're still kind of independently farming. It's like, here's, you can use a farmland, but in order to do it, you need these parts continuously. It's like you just rent your land, land essentially, yeah. in a way. Uh, it's a privilege to grow our crops, and you can buy them again. Well, I mean, there's there's actually a lot of other pretty interesting conspiracy when it comes to GMOs, and you can kind of go down that rabbit hole a little further. But I think we're kind of running out of time. So uh, we'll kind of wrap it up with our side of the GMO talk for right now. All right. But we want to hear from you at spacebuzzthedispensary.com. Click on the Weighing In tab, select the conspiracy icon, and feel free to tell us what you've been thinking as you've been listening in on our conversation. Yeah, and like the Share On podcast on Spotify, YouTube, and also check out our Twitch channel at spacebudsthedispensary.com and click on our Twitch link. Or it's gaming, right? (laughs) (laughs) Definitely make sure to watch the video for this podcast too on YouTube or at spacebudsthedispensary.com. There's definitely lots of fun graphics you guys will get to see. All right, so this has been Episode 7 of Space Buzz, the podcast. Join us again next time for your dose of sci-fi, conspiracy, and cannabis that only Space Buzz, the podcast, can provide. Thanks for listening. Peace out, yo. Later, space cadets. Take care, everyone.